Great, thank you. Welcome back everyone to uh, House Judiciary. Uh, we're taking testimony on H317, an act relating to establishing the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics and the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics Advisory Panel. And next on our uh, uh, agenda for witnesses is Karen Gannett. Thank you, Representative Burdett. Oops, I should un... Hi there. There was a Good suggestion... Morning. Good morning. There was a suggestion that Susanna Davis go before me and I'm happy to have that happen if that works for the committee. Uh, she actually had sent a note out saying that she didn't have any time constraints. So um, okay. I, I think we're all set. Thank okay. you. Great, you're welcome. Um, for the record, I'm Karen Gannett. I'm the executive director of Crime Research Group, which is an independent and nonpartisan nonprofit organization. And we work solely in the state of Vermont. Um, we have contracts with nonprofit agencies and departments, state departments, um, to work on criminal justice data collection and analysis. Um, we do data requests. Um, we get requests primarily from attorneys on the going rate for sentencing for crimes in Vermont. We also provide technical assistance. We've worked with um, your committee, House Judiciary, Senate Judiciary, and the Sentencing Commission on reviewing all crimes in the state of Vermont and penalties to assist with recommendations to reclassify the criminal code. Um, we have researchers on staff that have looked at the data across criminal justice systems in the Department of Corrections, criminal histories in the Vermont Crime Information Center, um, the judiciary and um, other agencies. And we have actually written the code to merge the data across those systems so we can actually do analysis using the data from all those systems. We have data sharing agreements, um, a master data, data sharing agreement with the judiciary for their data. We have a master data sharing agreement with the Vermont Crime Information Center for criminal histories. We're working on a master agreement with the Department of Corrections. Um, and so we have a lot of experience in the criminal justice system. We've been the um, statistic, acted as the statistical analysis center for the state of Vermont. Every state has one and they look at data collection and analysis for criminal justice data. We've been doing that for almost seven years as crime research group. And we've been doing that prior to being crime research group for since 1987 actually, um, with an iteration of the organization over time. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. My lead researcher, Robin Joy, has about 19 years of experience with criminal justice data in the state of Vermont. So I just wanted to lay the groundwork a little bit for this. Um, and then I want to say we're not a competitor for the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics. But we do have a lot of information about how the system in Vermont works. And we do have a lot of information about data in Vermont. And we have a lot of experience with creating and developing relationships in order for us to get the data that's important to do this work. So I just wanted to say, lay some groundwork for you all. We support the placement of the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics as written in the, um, in the bill as written um, with the Office of Racial Equity. We think that it's important, significant, and significant to strengthen this office with data analysts that can actually use the criminal justice data and other data potentially to look at racial disparities across systems. It's, very, it's, a, it's a unique entity, the Office of Racial Justice Statistics, the Office of um, Racial Equity, and I think it's really important to build and strengthen that office to be able to do what they were meant to do as everyone envisioned in statute. And I just wanna remind folks that the Office of Racial Equity was set up as a place to identify and work to eradicate systemic racism within state government. 
One of the duties stated in the statute is to manage and oversee the statewide collection of race-based data to determine the nature and scope of racial discrimination within all systems of state government. And I think it's important not to de-emphasize that role by placing the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics somewhere else. This is an opportunity to raise up the office to do what they were meant to do. I actually thought um, Judge Grierson's comment about, you know, then the question becomes, do we make that office independent. And it made me think about the um, Center for Crime Victim Services, the Human Rights Commission, and the Commission on Women, who are all tied and linked to um, state government, but they're their own independent entities. And I want to echo also what others have said in other venues, that this is an opportunity to move towards equitable outcomes in housing, wealth, education, employment, health services, child welfare, not just criminal justice. So if there's a way to make this a broad vision and then do discrete analysis based on available data, I would suggest that we raise this up to be bigger than what's being envisioned in this bill, but include criminal justice in there as well. And I can't emphasize that enough. This is a really important issue across state government. And as I listen to people of color testify and talk in other venues, um, looking across systems and not just in the criminal justice system is something that becomes very important. And that was what was envisioned um, in the Office of Racial Equity. I also wanna share that um, you know, we, we've developed MOUs and data sharing agreements. We have contracts with state departments to do um, data analysis, to get the data and to conduct analysis on the data. And I wanna say the Agency of Digital Services has been critically important for facilitating access to the data. And again, in the statute creating the agency, the first responsibility listed includes the sharing of data information within state government. They understand the data systems in the state. They understand all the data systems in the state. They have people that are actually linked to all the different departments. So they understand how the data is kept, where the data is kept, what data is kept, and they understand the rules and regulations for accessing that data. And um, subsection, one of the subsections in the statute defines information technology activities as the creation, collection, processing, storage, management, transmission, or conversion of electronic data, documents, or records. So it's actually built into statute that they are the organization to help with those things with the data collection. Excuse me. One of the things that I have always been, um, way before my time with CRG, I worked for the judiciary for 10 years. And before that I worked um, in a criminal, in um, the AHS regional partnership. It was the precursor to the, the field service directors around the state. And I did that in Rutland County for 10 years. And one of the things I always looked for is what do we have already that we can build on? What knowledge, what expertise, who's already doing this and how do we build on the capacity of those organizations? And I think in this instance, you, we have the ability to build on things that were already, that are fairly new actually. The Office of Racial Equity is fairly new and the agency of ADS is fairly new. So my suggestion would be, why don't we use them in the capacity that they've already been built up for to do some of this work. So the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, some of the data listed, and this is a little more um, getting down into the weeds a bit, um, some of the data listed in the bill, um, we did some consulting with RDAP and talked about um, 
the data list and actually in their report, we have added a column to the data list that shows what data are available, what data are not available, um, what data need to be extra extracted manually, um, and also what data need to be calculated. So the data, not all the data in those lists are readily available. And as um, Judge Grierson was mentioning, some of them are governed by other rules and regulations and laws that keep them from being shared. Um, so part of the discussion is what data are available and actually can be shared. And I think that um, another point I wanted to make is I think independence can be achieved in different ways. Um, in the bill that talks about the office of the child advocate, there's a line in there that talks about the office shall act independently of a state department in the performance of its duties. So there is precedence for putting language in a bill that creates some semblance of independence. And again, um, I thought Judge Grierson's comment about making an independent office was, was very interesting and really beefing up the office to do the work for um, around racial equity. The other, um, another point I wanted to make is there are other bills that have data collection included in them. Um, and it was really actually fascinating to read through these other bills. One is H-265, which is the Office of Child Advocates, and it includes data disaggregated by race, ethnicity, gender, et cetera, um, and any other categories that the advocate deems necessary. H-210, the Office of Health Equity, creates an Office of Health Equity for more and consistent data collection and access to better understand health equities in Vermont. And health equity data talks about demographic data included, but not limited to race, ethnicity, primary language, age, gender, et cetera, that can be used to track health equity. S16 has a robust section on the collection of education data under the powers and duties of a new task force on school exclusionary discipline reform. This bill proposes to create the School Discipline Advisory Council to collect and analyze data regarding school discipline in Vermont public and approved independent schools. H-159 also talks about economic development, housing, general affairs. This bill has a section on state BIPOC business development in part to create a portal to improve state data collection to better serve the variety of identities represented within the BIPOC community. And when it becomes active, they want race data, ethnicity, and gender for individuals registering businesses. And I think these bills all speak to the comprehensive nature of racial disparities and the wide ranging data that are associated with it. And I think rather than separating this out into separate data collection where you've got a bunch of different entities asking for the same data, some same, some not so same, um, but it's all pointing to looking for racial disparities in the system. I think it's, it, it, it's important to look at what's a way to create a place, an office, the bureau, so that all this can be looked at in one area, collected at one time. There may be different analyses going on for different data sets, but a lot of this information being collected is, is similar. We're currently working on, there's another piece, there's another body of work that I think it's really important to talk about. Um, and it really has to do with data integration. We're working right now with the Vermont National Criminal Justice Reform Project. Um, Department of Public Safety are the leaders in this. Um, the national organizations involved in this are the National Governors Association and the National Association on Criminal Justice. The Arnold Foundation is, is funding the project. Um, we have a proposal into them right now that they're reviewing. 
And it includes a process. One of the things we've learned through this, and believe me, I am, I am um, not a technology wizard by any stretch of the imagination. So it took me a couple times of hearing this to understand the implications and importance of creating a process for data governance, creating data requirements, and then looking at architecture, the technology needed to make that happen. Um, we've been working with this, an organization called Search, which is a was the is the premier justice sharing information organization in the country. Um, they are technical assistants on this project, and one of their TA folks has talked with us and given us a path forward for. Exactly that data gov how do you do data governance? You know, how do you get the departments to agree that they're going to share their data with you and what data can be shared and what rules and regulations there are around each piece of data? Data requirements are something that we do with our um, clients all the time. And that is we have to actually know what their data fields look like and have those conversations and build those relationships so we can talk to them about. What is what how what's the code for this field? What does this field look like? How do we get that data out of the system so we can actually do our analyses? And that's a really important piece of information. And then the data architecture needed to make that happen. I want to say again, ADS has been critically important for getting those conversations done because they understand exactly all those things. And I think to build this somewhere else, when you have systems in place to make this happen, um, we should at least take a look at that and see what they have to offer. And one of the things I wanna offer, um, we, we talk about this all the time at CRG um, with my researchers. Um, in each department, the structure of the data is different. The judiciary uses charges to enter data into their system. DOC uses person data, individual person data. Law enforcement uses incidents. Now we have a way to merge that data. But for you, think about this. If you wanna find out how many books you bought this year and what they cost, how would you do that? So the possible sources of data, if any of you are still using checks, you might write a check to Bear Pond Books. And so you can look at your checkbook and see where, the, where your checks went to Bear Pond Books. Um, you might use a credit card and you've bought books at different places using your credit card. You might buy books from Amazon. So then you have to look at your Amazon orders to see where you bought the books and how much you spent there. These are all different data structures. So now you've got three sources of data that you're attempting to get data out of. They all look different. Your checkbooks look, looks different from your credit card statement, looks different from your Amazon order report. So then how do you merge that data? And that's what we're trying to get at are the complexities of taking data from different systems when it's set up in different structures and different formats and merging it together so we have a complete picture. So that's just to kind of help visualize some of the work that, that needs to be done behind the scenes. And that's all I have today. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I was lucky to come back shortly after you started and um, very helpful and thorough testimony. Appreciate it. Um, that's, oh, I was gonna say, okay, do see Martin, go ahead. Well, uh, thank you very much, Karen. I, I take it you don't want us to give you authority to uh, make all these administration uh, in courts and everybody uh, provide the data. That's probably a rhetorical question, but I just want to I want to confirm how you fit into the whole system. I would say we're consultants on this. I would right. say we have the information and knowledge to share how this works, and we would be willing to work with um, the Bureau as it's set up to right. figure out how to use the data to get at racial disparities. And I guess I wanna make one last um, comment if I may, and that's that it's not just about the numerical data and quantitative analysis, it's also about qualitative analysis. 
one of the things we learned in doing some of our um, racial disparity work with the data is that um, people of color, their stories aren't necessarily reflected in the numbers. And that's a really important piece. And it, it, it's a very emotional piece um, from the conversations we've had. And I think it's really important to figure out how to do a really rigorous qualitative analysis using those stories and analyzing them rigorously to figure out the patterns and the trends that are going on in the state of Vermont so that we can better understand what's happening because the numerical data don't always tell us those things. So, so just uh, for however, wherever we end up with this, uh, is it uh, helpful or appropriate for us to put into whatever legislation some sort of charge to to either to, to, to CRG to uh, assist or you know in, in this or to the bureau to look to CRG because I could CRG you folks have uh, as deep a knowledge as anybody in, in the data as you said as a consultant but should there be something in the legislation to make sure that connection occurs? That's an interesting question. I'm not sure it has to be legislated. I mean, it would depend right. on how much, you know, in, in my world as a small nonprofit, it would depend on how much work would be expected of us. Um, if a lot of work is expected and, and, and um, we're more than willing to do it, there might need to be some funding for that. But otherwise we do this under, um, we do this as technical assistance for a lot, a lot of different agencies. Right. I just know that we do have you in other places, like I think our Justice Reinvestment may have specifically listed you as helping out with RDAP and such, or maybe it didn't. I, 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 maybe yeah, I'm the, sure, but I think we occasionally do uh, have your name in there as part of task forces. Yeah. Certainly, certainly what led to our, well, and the Sentencing Commission as well, that you're involved yeah. in that. So yeah, there are points, but yeah, I understand the balance. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Kate. Okay. Sorry, took a minute to unmute there. Um, thanks. I was curious, um, so one of the conversations that is continuing to come up is this idea of like, how, how do we compel the data? Like, how do, how do we make sure that we can receive the data from the various parties that we're trying to get it from? And um, the previous uh, person who was, who was offering testimony was talking about how it would be helpful to talk to folks who are most intimately involved currently with the collection of data to get a sense of you know, what do they call upon when, they, when they're when they running into obstacles to getting the data that they need? Um, and it was in the context of like, it, you know, where do we place this office? And, 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 but essentially just this question of like, I guess I'm curious from your perspective, because you're so involved in the like minutia of gathering data, what your experience has been in terms of what's been most effective at um, overcoming obstacles to getting the data that you need if you're running into an agency or a space that is feeling reluctant or maybe dragging their feet or there's other kinds of reasons that the data is not being received that's outside of just like they don't have you know it takes a while because they don't have the operational systems in place but other other kinds of issues that might get in the way that's a good question um representative donnelly and i'm and it's a bit of a complex question because it goes to what's available in their data sets and what they can extract. So for example, we were doing a, uh, we we're taking a look at probation data and we were working with their third party vendor and we submitted using um, the ADS representative over at the Department of Corrections, we submitted a list of data that we were looking for and the data came back in a, the data didn't come back in uh, useful um, to us. So we had to go back to the drawing board and, and have those conversations again. So that's, that was one issue. Um, I have not found any department that we have worked with to date to be reluctant. To, well, I shouldn't say that. Most departments are not reluctant to give us information. I think it's a matter of building those relationships. I will say when we first started working with law enforcement, this is a good example of this. Um, back when I started with CRG about six and a half years ago, we didn't have any relationship with law enforcement. Um, 
VCJR, which is the, the name previous to CRG, used to get the law enforcement data from something called VCON, Vermont Crime Online. Some of you might um, recognize that. And it was a system set up at the Department of Public Safety that had all um, the data from law enforcement in it that then got um, transferred to the FBI. And the researchers could go in and just get that data and do their analysis. Things happened and VCON was no longer um, available and was no longer being kept up. Um, and so it, it felt very necessary to us to start building relationships with the police department so we could get their data and we could do analysis on crime data. And so we started talking with the two governance boards that governed the two CAT RMSs for the police. And initially when we went there, um, they all own their own data. And um, one chief who is no longer there anymore pointed his finger at me and said, you know, you're not gonna get your hands on our data. and I was a little taken aback, and but eventually, after talking with them and after um, sharing with them what we were going to use the data for, that stopped. And the different police departments and the sheriff's departments were willing to share their data with us. And so I think the relationship building is a really important piece when you're dealing with reluctant people. Um, but I think most people, when, when you let them know what you're going to be doing with their data, if it's available to share with you, um, you know, barring any rules and regulations and laws, um, people want to know what's going on in their department. And they want to make things helpful. better. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Any any other questions? No. Great. Thank you. Thank you again, Karen. Appreciate you. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, uh, Susanna, I think you're here somewhere. Susanna Davis. I am here. <laughs> welcome. Thank you very much. Um, there you are. <laughs> nice to see you. Great. You as well. Thank you. Um, for the record, Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state. Uh, I, I can be very brief. Of course, I'm, you know, remain available for questions, but um, I suppose I, I can distill very cleanly um, <clears throat> my feedback on, on this proposed bill. First of all, I support um, any efforts that we want to make to expand and improve data collection. I think it's really important that we recognize the deep, we have recognized the deep disparity in justice outcomes by race. Um, and so taking this step, I think represents that acknowledgement and a sincere effort to try to correct those disparities by understanding them through the collection and reporting of data. So I support those efforts. Um, I will say that the big question in the room or one of the big questions in the room has been, where do we cite such a bureau? And um, I know there have been a number of proposals or recommendations put out there on where to house it. Personally, I think that it would be a natural fit to put it in a racial equity office. However, I don't think that a racial equity office is necessarily a natural fit in itself for the agency of administration. And therefore, I wonder if this bureau um, would be better situated in another agency that's more topically or substantively relevant to the other functions of that agency. And I'm thinking about this, not just for this particular work, but down the line when we create six more bureaus and units um, and suddenly we have a Pluto Kuiper belt situation where nothing seems to fit. So um, that that's my only caveat, but again, you know, should the legislature choose to move forward with citing this in AOA under racial equity, provided that there's adequate staff support for this specific work stream, um, it would it it would be a welcome addition to to the office. Um, but again, I do caution us to consider if building it this way is structurally a natural fit. The other thing that I that I would say because I, I just can't help myself is um, while I love the idea of a Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics, it also really begs us to 
look at how are we addressing racial uh, justice statistics for other oppressed communities, people living with disabilities, people experiencing poverty and homelessness, mental illness, people, uh, members of the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, and so as we consider this big step of creating this bureau, I ask us also to consider equity across all those other spectrums as well. Great. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. That's really very helpful. I've been waiting for your testimony. So thank you so much. Uh, let's see, Barbara and then Martin. Hello. So you raised two really important points, and I'm wondering if if the data, um, if this project were to be housed in a bureau with other um, statistics that get collected, so it, it isn't going to create problems down the line, would it make sense to have a dotted line or have it be um, an employee of your office, but housed in a different office as a collaboration? Mm -hmm. um, so that's one question. And then I started thinking about your second point and um, the Human Rights Commission, um, not that necessarily it housed there, but having that same um, kind of dotted line. And I know, I mean, I know that happens in state government all the time, um, for people to collaborate and report somewhere else. Um, so I'm just wondering how that would seem. Yeah, thank you, Representative. I think there are a lot of creative ways that we could structure an org chart that make, that make sense and that make best use of the work and the resources. Um, you know, one, one suggestion that I've heard a couple of times so far on this morning's testimony has been to create an independent body, office. Um, and if that were the case, um, then I could see a lot of really great potential for that being expanded outside the scope of racial equity to include equity in more forms. I could see it uh, focusing not just on justice, but also on things like education equity, housing equity, et cetera. Right. Um, of course, not to overstep the bounds of the HRC, which does have enforcement authority over public accommodations, um, employment, et cetera. But in terms of having an administrative agency or office that is dedicated to the policy and the education and the service providing side of things, that could be very powerful. And, and um, I don't want to talk out of turn too much because, of course, I have big ideas for what that could look like. But I think that that's certainly something to consider. Another, um, another consideration that I have heard, and I think it's a valid one um, and, and should be discussed, is the importance of independence when it comes to um, this kind of work. You all have heard me say in other contexts that personally, I think any, any, any office that serves as a watchdog of government would probably be better to be independent. I think that our current, um, our current administration here is clearly motivated by issues of equity and justice. And I don't, I don't worry that this admin would, would be problematic in getting this work done but we make these decisions for any admin that comes in in the future. Exactly, exactly. It's not about a person, but the what makes sense. Um, I, I also think it would be incredibly helpful for the Human Rights Commission to have that data to see, you know, are their trainings making a difference? Like where are, you know, because I don't know how much data they are able to collect right now. So, I love your expansion idea. I think we would need to source it accordingly and not be like, oh, while you're doing that, could you collect this and this and get the Medicaid, you know, like, I, cause then it'll just be repeating the one person office. Uh, so yeah, I mean, and right. I mean, and then I think of people who fall into more than one uh, discrimination box and making sure we're covering the person of color with a disability that is trans and not, you know, yeah. So yeah, I'm glad that you're thinking big and that independence seems really important because if it is in the administration and you don't have a direct role, 
it seems like we could set up again, structurally not about the people, uh, you know, it could be budding heads about what's important to collect. So thank you. Thank you. And you know, there are drawbacks as well to that, to that level of separation. I mean, for example, there are certain restrictive regulations that prohibit sharing of data across certain agencies, even within the And so as we consider um, who would have as to which data and how hard are they gonna have to struggle to be able to you know, get information, um, that's another thing to consider. So in, in that sense, perhaps housing something more in-house might be of greater benefit. I think that is gonna depend on how the legislature chooses to structure it. And um, does it then make sense to consider as a pilot, like it's gonna be in this office for the next three years and then we're gonna revisit where state government is with collecting data and what makes sense. I mean, so that, because, because maybe what makes sense in the very beginning won't make, you know, it could morph into something else, but at least it would get off to a start that's sort of synchronized with the work that you're doing. Possibly. Um, I, I appreciate the, the openness and the flexibility of that sort of proposal. Um, but, you know, it, it, it could be tricky. Uh, for example, I know that AHS agents, uh, departments may be subject to certain kinds of trainings regularly. So if we house something in, I don't know, ADS at first and then move it to AHS, have they gotten really sector specific, you know, gotten accustomed to a certain kind of training environment or a certain kind of operational environment and need to switch that? Is that going to impact the work somehow? Um, how, how do we do funding at that point, distributing of um, staff positions, et cetera? So we would have to work it out. But what I appreciate about that proposal is um, that it remains open and flexible based on ongoing monitoring of that office's success and outcomes. Right. Right, it's, it's, there are pros and cons to each, you know, like it's, yeah, anyway, thank you. Uh, Martin. Thank you, Susanna. It's nice to see you again, even though yesterday your screen was blank uh, at the RDAP, but that's, <laughs> it's good to see you this morning. Um, so the way that, uh, and if you've been at the RDAP meetings, you've probably have heard this coming from me there, I mean, I'm really looking at this, and I think from what uh, Professor Crocker's uh, testimony was as well, is there are two aspects of it. It's the data collection, and then it's the data analysis. Mm -hmm. And from the testimony I've heard and from just understanding where we are, it, it just seems that the data collection to have the appropriate authority has to be somewhere in the administration. I think, I think uh, an independent entity is somewhat hamstrung, although we'd certainly create independent en entities with subpoena power and all those kind of things, but I'd rather not do that. I'd rather be in a collaborative sense. So my, my thinking, I'd like your comment on this is, you know, really splitting those two things off and, and the data collection, it just absolutely seems that the agency of digital services and the, uh, under the chief data officer for that matter, is the, the most appropriate place that we have right now, uh, has the knowledge, has the skills, has the ability to oversee this. I understand there needs to be more resources to get it done, uh, but on the resource side, I'll jump to another, you know, I'm sorry, I'm talking a lot, but I just wanna set this up. Yeah, from what I heard from Professor Crocker as well is that it's, it's a lot of upfront cost to get these systems to talk together, to get it set up, and then it should be running a little more smoothly. And, and I do understand that uh, the racial and other disparities uh, that we're seeing have really been highlighted in COVID. Uh, and I think that maybe there's some COVID money that can be actually put towards that setup component of it. Uh, but we would need to know what those resources are that are needed. But before even that, we would need to kind of get the commitment of the Agency of Digital Services that they do want to be this entity. But it just makes a lot of sense to me, uh, uh, the many bills that actually uh, 
Karen uh, discussed, we're, we already have put into place bills that we've sent over to the Senate or the Senate has sent over to us seeking all sorts of data. And this is just one more aspect of it is the criminal justice data. So, and then, you know, if we could figure out that collection side, if that data becomes available, a data set, it can be used by your office. It could be used by UVM. It could be used by the Racial Justice Alliance who have their own data crunchers. Uh, but it's it's getting that common data set, it seems, mm -hmm. is a separate issue. And really, I've not heard of a better place to put it than in the agency of digital services. So if you could comment on that, and if you could give any guidance on how to proceed, uh, if in fact, I mean, I'd rather not just dictate this from the legislature, but actually work with the administration to make sure we're doing this right. So I, that was a long setup for if you just kind of comment on where my thinking is going on this. Sure. I think Professor Cracker's um, testimony was extremely helpful in helping un understand the the sort of, I guess, the chain of command or the chain that the data has to take. And I agree that there's the technical aspect of the collection of it, the housing of it, and the trans, you know, digital translation, the ones and the zeros, right? Um, and then there's the reporting. And in order to do the technical piece of it, perhaps you don't have to have um, substantive knowledge of the underlying criminal justice issues if you're just collecting information. Um, but it, it tastes very strange to, to, to go with that. So if we were to put something like this in ADS for collection purposes, I would still feel strongly that somebody who knows something about justice, um, not just from the you know legal is legal perspective, but from the social perspective, who knows about justice, be be in charge or involved with that within ADS. Um, that's the way that we're going to have somebody who can spot errors, trends, or um, unusual things in the data. Because if you don't know what to look for, then you don't know if your collection is actually working. Um, so that's one thing. And then in terms of analysis, I agree with you, Representative, that the um, we've got a lot of entities who can do a lot with the data once we get it. Community groups like the Racial Justice Alliance and um, you know other entities we have like you know ACLU, what have you, and then other state agencies as well. So I think once we get the data, the the, the analysis part of it and, and being able to use it responsibly, we have a lot of entities that can handle that. Um, and again, that's going to go back to the conversation about data use, data management, and sharing agreements. So in terms of the collection, I suppose to answer your question, which you can tell I'm, I'm struggling to struggling to come with an answer, but um, I, I don't want to speak on Secretary Quinn's behalf. Um, of course, I think his, his uh, ADS is perfectly capable of doing the collection. Um, it, topically, it is incongruous with their work. So you know, it's, we have to ask ourselves, um, are, are we okay with that? Um, they can, I'm, I'm, again, I'm confident they can do the nuts and bolts of it, um, but this feels more like policy and less like IT support. Um, and so I just wanna make sure that if we, if we do begin to, you know, narrow that line between the two, that, um, that we have the right staff in place who, who can swiftly move between both. I hope that makes sense the way that I've said it. No, I, I think I think so. And I guess, I mean, the other thing that would be would be helpful, and and uh, I don't know if this is something we direct in legislation, taking a slightly different tack than what we have here, is is asking the agency of the administration, which you know, under that would be you, an agency of digital services, uh, to tell us the game plan for the collection. And that includes the technical part and what should be collected, but then also some sort of independent body uh, providing oversight on that. Uh, you know, it, the, the problem is trying to figure out from our, where we're sitting, what the best way to do this when really it's the, I think, it's the administration that is in a better place to, to help us uh, tell us how best to do this. And, and then us certainly interjecting you know, how we would want to have some sort of oversight, independent oversight as well. Um, but we can ponder that a little bit further. 
I'm yeah. not sure how to proceed with this because yeah, I really I think this is critical that we we make progress and we start the process of being able to collect this data. We've been dealing with this for the last four years of trying you know, at a minimum the last four years, probably longer, to try to make sure that we're making our decisions a little bit more data driven. And and I don't want to see this just run into a wall. <laughs> Uh, because we don't quite have it right in this document yet, I don't think. Uh, maybe we do. Any event, I'll, I'll stop rambling on. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ken, Kate, and Selena. Uh, good morning, Susanna. Um, we have a lot of data that's already been collected, I believe, whether and in my mind, we've created um, a lot of walls of, of, of what's looked at and what isn't looked at. But is there enough uh, available there uh, for, for you to um, look at it and start getting a handle on, on what's going on with, with uh, the society in Vermont? Yes, Representative, we know what's going on. It's systemic racism. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm being a little facetious here, but yes, we have a lot of data that we do already collect um, and it does point us to trends and disparities. And some of those we're already addressing um, work through uh, justice reinvestment and a number of the bills that you all are, al are already moving this session and have moved last session. So there are data that are informing our decisions and that we're able to really get insight um, into a lot of the disparities. And yet um, there's always the case, there's always the case to continue and to expand the data collection and not just to expand it, but to refine it. Because often we see disconnect in things that seem like little points, but actually could add up to be quite big ones. For example, um, there are some entities that believe that race data should be perceived and others who believe that it should be self-identified. And this matters because if I get stopped or arrested or what have you, and we're going by perceived data, they're gonna log one African-American female. If it's self-identified, then they're gonna log one Latina. And that's gonna skew numbers, right? Especially when we're talking about a population that only represents 4% of the state. So, um, so those are the, the things that sometimes seem minute, but in fact have larger ripple effects. And so um, I guess the short answer to your question is yes, we have data already that do and can continue to inform our work. Um, but the centralization and um, uniformity of our collection is where we can really make big improvements. And so I think this proposal stands to do that. Um, the question is just how do we structure it organizationally in a way that makes sense and is sustainable? I hope I've answered and, your question. And, and, and I think with your experience so far, you have some really good ideas how to do that, correct? Got some ideas, yeah. Um, I mean, most I think most of the best ideas that I've seen on these topics have come from the community. And so it's, it's always my preference to defer to them and to people with, with that lived experience. But I look, I look to you for the leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kate. Thanks. Um, I, I don't know, maybe this is just a comment. I guess I just felt compelled to raise my hand um, listening to Martin <clears throat> talking. And maybe I'm just reiterating to some of what you were saying. Um, it just feels important to, to name as we're having these conversations that this isn't in my mind just about gathering certain data points. Like, you know, I think we have to look at, I guess this is what concerns me when we talk about having it housed within um, a department that is specifically focused on data collection is it feels like we're talking about a space that has to merge, you know, an expertise in data collection with an expertise in social and racial equity issues. And that's, you know, data doesn't exist in a vacuum. You have people who are determining the kind of data that we're seeking, who are analyzing that data, who are, you know, um, like was stated before, looking at trends, things of that nature. And so, you know, 
I feel I feel like if we're talking about housing it within a department that's focused purely on data, I would want to really go through this bill with a fine tooth comb to ensure that the way that the the specific department is operating and the people who are hired to perform these jobs have an expertise in social and racial equity so that we can make sure that that aspect of it is being captured. Thank you, Representative. Yeah, it's it's um, you know, it's tricky. This is this is work that is necessarily technical in nature and necessarily policy focused in purpose, and and it is about marrying those two in a way that that makes sense. Thank you for your comment. Thank you, uh, Selena. Yeah, thanks. Um, this might be a little redundant, but I just. I know the, I went back and looked at the RDAP sort of list of eight, you know, possible places. And I know the Agency of Digital Services is on there, but it was really my impression from their testimony that they were kind of, from, from Aton's testimony, at least, that there was some weighting of um, those more independent options, such as standing up a new agency or the Human Rights Commission, or um, I think there were a couple that, and I, I just, I know you're, I think you're on the that advisory panel, and I think I'm hearing you say something similar, a little bit similar in your testimony around just the importance of that independence, and I don't want to make you you know, have to repeat yourself, but I just, I just don't, if you want to expound it all and just tell me if I'm understanding your um, testimony correctly, that would be helpful for me. Believe it or not, I do not formally sit on the RDAP. I think that's the one, the one that I don't. Uh, I think it was created before this role had, had existed. Um, in any event, but, but I do attend all the meetings and have been uh, sitting in on their conversations about this. So again, you know, I'm going to, um, say what, what David Scher said earlier, which is I would probably defer to Eitan to speak on the panel's behalf. And I think you have at least one more RDAP member coming in to, this morning to testify. Um, but, but what I can say is that my assessment of those conversations is similar to yours, Representative, that um, it appears that the RDAP does have a greater preference for a more independent citing uh, of, of this bureau. Um, rather than housing it in, in something that, that's really directly overseen by the admin. But again, I, I will let the, the committee speak for itself. I will say, you know, again, I, I speak to the importance of independence, not because of considerations for, um, you know, any current players, but just because historically in the United States, we've seen equity work get sidelined with the coming and going of different, um, of different leaders. Right. We saw this between Lincoln and Johnson. We saw this between, I mean, you name it, Sherman and then after Sherman. And pretty much it's um, it's it's a defense mechanism more than anything to protect the longevity and the long term um, integrity of the work. So. Um, so, yeah, I just I hope that that, <clears throat> excuse me, comes across as just a, a big consider, like a, an overarching consideration and not necessarily concern over any you know current current players. Um, you know, that being said, again, I, I, I reiterate with, with appropriate, you know, staff support and with the flexibility, um, perhaps that, um, that, rep <clears throat> excuse me, that Representative Rachelson my, uh, mentioned earlier, I think that um, we can certainly, we can certainly do the work. Um, I, I, I trust in AOA's capabilities. Uh, I just, I ask us again to consider as we build up this body of work, are we gonna feel like it makes sense in structure in three years, five years, six years? Thanks, that's really helpful, thank you. Thank you, uh, Martin. So um, I wonder if you have any um, insight or input on how we could give an independent authority sufficient independent entity sufficient authority to be able to wrest this data out of potentially reluctant agencies. So that's where my biggest issue is I'm trying to 
figure out? And if you have any insight or suggestions or thoughts on that. Yeah, um, you know, I, I would probably, I would say that the sort of quasi-independent agencies that exist might be good models. Um, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily want to have to resort to things like subpoena power. That's heavy. Not that it's a bad thing, but it's, it's heavy and maybe it doesn't have to be necessary. Um, if we structure, I mean, look, we already have a couple of bills that I think were passed last session um, that have improved or expanded access to justice data for the executive director of racial equity, um, which is something that the legislature was able to mandate. And now the AOA kind of enforces that. So there's a lot of, and so, so already providing more data access to um, an internal agency like AOA is something that we've, we've made a possibility. Now, maybe that just means something as simple as creating a data sharing agreement with that independent or quasi independent agency um, if AOA is not reluctant to give those data, right? Instead of having to wrestle it from 80 different, 78 different agencies, um, perhaps just have it funneled to an internal centralized place um, and used as needed um, by, by that, that other entity. Again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan of, of huge government, so I don't wanna create more layers of, of bureaucracy and process. Um, but of course, if we're just thinking creatively about how to make sure that this work has real integrity and real teeth, um, then that's something to consider. And, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of our focus here, um, of course, is on the data collection and the data reporting. And these are important pieces of it. Um, but again, can't help myself. I, I again have to stress um, more than anything, I want to make sure that we're doing something about it once we once we get those those data and those numbers. Um, and that's not that's not as a sort of counterpoint to anything that's been said here. It just needs to be said in addition. So what was the legislation? Is it something you can actually point me to a little more specifically? Yeah. I'm sorry. It'll take me a couple of minutes to pull it up, but I can um, I can give you that that act number. All right, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Are you? I, you were muted. I didn't know. It's just sorry, Maxine. I didn't know if you were calling on me or not. You were muted. No, I I, I wanted to give Susanna time to pull oh, up the app number. Yeah, and then I'm and then looking, I can still take. I I mean I'm yeah I can still talk to you while I'm. I just won't look at you for a second. <laughs> that's okay. Take take your time. No, that's okay. Take your time. Thank you. S219. Act 147, which was S219. Which came out of this, uh, which came out of this uh, committee, actually. <laughs> so I should, have, I should have probably remembered that. Yep. Uh, and specifically, it states uh, that state grant funding for law enforcement shall be contingent on the agency or constable complying with the race data reporting requirements set forth in 20 VSA 2366 section E within six months prior to the Secretary of Administration's review of the proposed grant funding. Thanks. And we added more categories uh, to race data collection and fair and impartial policing. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, Kate. Thanks, sorry, I was clearly very eager to <laughs> catch my question. Um, so maybe this is sort of what you were just referring to, Susanna, I guess. So when we talk about white supremacist culture, there is a strong reliance on data mm -hmm. and this sort of desire to, you know, that, that anecdotal evidence and stories of people, real lived experiences are, are devalued and what's valued is this sort of, what's claimed to be valued is this like hard evidence. Um, but I also feel like there's ample evidence to suggest that even when we do have data, <laughs> we can present the data, that still for, for many people isn't quite enough. 
And I worry sometimes, and I'm not, I really support efforts like this bill and that, you know, in part because I think it ultimately, it continues to remove obstacles that people can sort of hide behind and continues to bring the story up to the forefront. But I don't know, I mean, maybe this is an unfair question to ask you, but I guess I'm just sort of curious I'm worried that we're going to spend years and millions of dollars gathering boatloads of data to prove what we already know. <laughs> and, the, and, and where does that, where does that leave us exactly? And I guess I'm just curious from your perspective, like, you know, if you, if you sort of could dictate the next three years of addressing these issues of systemic racism in Vermont, like, would you be putting that time and money into data gathering? Would you be putting it into other forms of intervention that, that are addressing the issues that we that we ultimately know we're going to find. Like we, I think we know what we're going to find when we when we pull this data together. Um, so again, I'm not sure that that's a fair question, but I just felt compelled to ask it. Yeah, um, there's a lot in in your question, and I appreciate it because one is qualitative and quantitative information, um, as you mentioned, and both are extremely important. Um, Yes, it is often the case that we maintain existing disparate systems by relying on things like data and numbers and rigidity and excluding or, or ignoring um, stories and lived experience. And that's why it's really important that we're capturing both. And so I think the state should continue to do that, whether it's through this bureau or through additional efforts. Um, so I agree we shouldn't prize the qualitative over the, the quantitative over the qualitative. Separately to your point about um, is, is the juice worth the squeeze or are we just gonna find more of what we already know? Um, I think we're gonna find more of what we already know and we'll be more secure in that knowledge because we'll know that we did our due diligence in collecting it thoroughly. So yes, I, I think that if we're gonna spend money on this Let's not make it exorbitant because we already have a lot of data collection systems in place that are pointing us to disparities. So let's beef up those systems, but let's also make the bulk of our equity investment in the, the correction of the upstream things that are leading to those disparities. And, and I say that, I know you all have heard, are probably sick of hearing me say that, but this was something that I said often in the conversation around staffing for the racial equity office, which was, um, Yes, staff are appreciated, but this should not represent the bulk of our equity work. The bulk of the equity work has to happen in the sectors where disparity is showing up. That means housing, that means education, that means employment, that means all of those other topics that are hard and, and, and um, hard and costly. So yes, I agree that this is a, a worthwhile investment, but it shouldn't be the only focus. Like I'm not going to take a spreadsheet and frame it and hang it on my wall and say the work is done. Thank you. Thank you. Just seeing if anybody, I don't see any other, any other hands. Well, thank you. Thank you as always for your thoughtful and helpful, helpful testimony. Good to, good to see you. You as well, thank you. Um, I'm gonna, I'll remain on, I guess, for if you have uh, more, more witnesses, but of course I'm available to come back anytime. Thank you for having me. Great, absolutely appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so I think um, if I remember Judge Grierson, I forget if he was free at 11.15 or was- um, He finished up, he, he gave us his input before uh, before our break, as did David Shear. Okay, all right, I'm sorry, so I missed that. Okay, so then I think that's everybody, right? I'm not missing anybody. I think that's right. Okay, um, so I think I'd like to turn to Coach and Martin. Um, for starters, the two of you have been sort of taking the lead in, in this um, in terms of discussion, next steps, what testimonies needed, just to kind of hear, your, hear your thoughts. We heard a lot of very helpful testimony this morning. Yeah. Um, and certainly other committee members as well. Um, so you know, if that, that works for 
for you, yeah, Martin. I'll, I'll okay. uh, defer to Coach initially, and I can certainly add my thoughts after. Uh, unless, uh, Coach, you're not ready to go, then I can share my thoughts. But no. um, I was very uh, quiet because you learn a lot more sometimes listening. Well, not sometimes, all the time. Um, we had some really great testimony today. Uh, we had great testimony on uh, uh, the day before. Uh, I'm going to go back to, uh, you know, the construct and thinking about the idea of S108 and H317. And so at first, when you look at it, you go, wow, this is really great. Uh, this makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's work we should do. And so it's in the center of this little map that I put together. I've got to figure out a way to, uh, uh, to get it, you know, on my, uh, on my laptop, because right now it's on my iPad. And so sharing it uh, at the moment is a little difficult. So I, I started with the bills, those two bills. Then I took all of the testimony that we've had so far. So Professor Sand and his comments, um, attorney, uh, Turner uh, and her thoughts, you know, for, uh, both from the Defender General's office and from RDAP. And, and what I started to see, uh, and then also uh, uh, Aton's um, testimony as well and uh, his explanation of RDAP's uh, uh, eight uh, considerations. So, so looking at it, well, wait a minute, there's something, um, you know, showing itself here. And, and what I started to see is, is that, and that some of it is what, uh, uh, Susanna mentioned as well, is in statute, we already have the functionality to get the data that we need to make these decisions. What three, uh, 317 would do, hopefully, is create an umbrella to ensure that the racial justice data points are all together. So going back over to uh, what's in existence, and when we look at how RDAP, for example, you know, is set up, a lot of the data that has been referred to uh, is already being analyzed, you know, by RDAP. When you look at uh, justice reinvestment, one and two, the work that's been done by the Council of State Governments, helping coordinate those activities have come back to our committee, have come back to Senator Sears committee, and also the Corrections Committee in the Senate, Corrections Committee here, and then also government operations in both. So the, the major users, you know, of the data are actually already in that oversight policy position. So you go a little deeper and you start looking at some of the legislation that we 
as the policymakers have already created, and you start to see even more more similarities or synergies, let's say. So you look at the Criminal Justice Training Council and the effect of data on their work and how, uh, especially in the last session, we've changed the structure you know, of the council to be more inclusive of the affected communities. That work was done recently. And another uh, piece of the justice reinvestment uh, work shows collaboration between the National Center for Restorative Justice. So now we're bringing in that uh, academic component again, you know, as well as uh, CRG in their work and our other academics, including like Dr. Seguino, um, Dr. Crocker, Dr. Fox, you know, we heard from Dr. Crocker this morning. We're already inter, um, intersecting, um, you know, with these entities. So the thought came to mind is where do they all end up? And right now, RDAP is comprised of all of those folks. So that what I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out on this limb and potentially suggest thinking in terms of possibly housing this with our debt. And there's another piece to that structure that as you look at RDAP's mandate and its uh, enabling legislation, it already has access to every single facet of racial, social justice and equity across all systems of state government. So, so my point being, you know, to those of us that are like, I'm not creating another wheel. You know, it, it, it's it's. Uh, I I won't use a a, a car analogy uh, because I I said to uh, uh, my colleague uh, Martin that I'd 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 kick I'd hold back on the automotive uh, metaphors. <laughs> so I'll 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 come up with a, a plant-based one. Um, but it's not about more government. You know, I think it's about trying to utilize quality. We, we have some very credible, high quality entities within the state of Vermont. And I think that they're already working together. And what you know, I'm I'm sensing here is is that if we help facilitate bringing these entities uh, at least to the table and under the auspices of an existing uh, entity that has the authority within a labeling uh, uh, legislation to do. I mean, I mean, it's it's almost replicating every uh, point within 317 being RDAP. Now, I, I know this is it's still uh, a skeleton uh, in the sense of an idea, uh, but I, I think it can be uh, clearly flushed out that there might be a pathway 
uh, without a lot of um, reinvention utilizing that path. But uh, that, that, that's just the Cliff Notes version of a thought. Thank you. Thank you. It's actually, that, that's, that's really interesting. It's very helpful. Thank you. Um, um, Martin, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, Coach and I have been kicking around ideas <laughs> for a very long time on these. Uh, and, and um, the, you know, RDAP is, is certainly a, a possibility for some things, but I, I'm not quite as on board as uh, coaches on that yet. And I think part of it is uh, RDAP, you know, last night, they, they're not going to get to look at this a little bit deeper until next month. So, uh, but that's fine. We need to do this right. We don't need to do this fast. But, but there are some issues with RDAP that they only meet once a month that they don't really have any administrative support. We'd have to, it'd have to be a fairly significant uh, adjustment of what RDAP is. And I'm not saying it's not the right entity, but it also has eight government employees as part of RDAP versus five people who are citizens. So one could argue uh, it's not entirely clear how independent they may or may not be. All things that can be addressed, but it's gonna take time to address. You know, I think the other thing to look at because I mean, RDAP really focuses again on criminal justice and, and what we're also hearing and not just from Karen in her testimony today, but I've been hearing from other legislators and just aware of it myself by looking at all these bills that are coming out with different uh, disparity data components uh, and Karen listed five and I, I agree that all five of those do have that, that this we probably need to find a way to have an entity that's dealing with this much more broadly than just the criminal justice data. I, the criminal justice data could be the start, but that's not necessarily the case because there are five other bills that are moving that are ahead of this. So there, you know, the health disparity data, the education data, the BIPOC business data, uh, which is uh, the Secretary of State primarily, may all be ahead of us, but this does point to maybe really taking a deep look of having some sort of a quasi independent entity like we, I don't know if I wanna bring up the child advocate as the one I would look to, but you know, uh, there, there's a number that were mentioned to today, crime victim services and some others, maybe we really do need to look at an independent quasi, you know, independent uh, agency that would also be able to balance that need for authority to get reluctant agencies to actually work with them. Um, so, I, you know, there's a lot to look at and maybe, maybe, you know, where we try to head because we're not going to resolve this, I don't think, uh, particularly since GovOps really is the right one to be talking about a lot of this and they happen to be pretty busy. Uh, do we try to uh, direct a group, I hate to call task force, but do we try to direct the appropriate entities to work this out over the off session and come back with the implementation plan? You know, uh, I think the work that went into S, or I mean, H317 is good. It identifies, I think a great part of it, which we haven't really talked that much about is the identity of the uh, high impact discretionary decisions that are made in the criminal justice uh, arena that we need to collect data on. I think that's great work and it's gotten the conversation going, but I'm kind of stuck in, in figuring out how best to proceed, but we could get the right people around the table, including uh, RDAP, including the agency of administration, be it the racial equity director and the agency of digital services, you know, we could, we could perhaps construct that with a very clear directive of what we want, but this would be bigger than just the judiciary committee as well, because of all the other committees that are, have bills seeking this kind of data. Um, I, I mean, I hate to punt this, but but there's, <laughs> it's a lot of uh, open questions that I don't think we're in a position to resolve. 
Well, I I guess uh, if I, I to to pick up on that that part of it, um, I don't know where this energy is coming from. Maybe my COVID shot is finally starting to turn around, and maybe it's infusing some kind of weird bug. <laughs> My my response is is that again uh, is is that you know I I really believe a lot of good work has gone into uh, the constructs that are in existence and and when I look at the uh, the work especially at the end of last session you know that really strengthened a lot of the work that we're talking about. Um, and and even even going back to um, you know just the thought of it's a shorter reach, I think f for from a structural perspective, looking at RDAP in a way, um, it it says in its enabling legislation about the terms, and granted there are uh, you know like the seats. A chief superior judge is on the group, uh, commissioner of corrections, public safety, children and families. That's a big one because that crosses almost every facet, you know, of, of the state when you look at, you know, AHS uh, in particular. You know, the missing, you know, component would be education. Um, and, you know, because of, you know, um, you know, that, that already um, design, you know, component, we have that access. And, and it also goes on to say, members of the panel, um, you know, shall um, select their chair and co-chair and not be um, state officials, you know, and that's in the enabling, uh, you know, legislation. Uh, so what they're doing is encouraging uh, that those public affected community member uh, members of th that commission already you know, are community members uh, and such as Eitan uh, and his co-chair. Um, the, the group that, uh, when we took testimony from uh, um, Professor Sand, um, it, it also uh, reinforced the work that's being done, um, you know, with within the National Center, you know, for restorative justice. Um, that collaboration with the law school and with UVM includes a number of our folks that spoke today. We also already have the relationship established, you know, with CRG, uh, and as noted, um, they're actually in uh, statute in a number of places, um, and so that relationship, you know, is there. I think some of the uh, back to Martin's, um, you know, questions, you know is I think convening some of the players um, over the next, uh, you know, you know, few days basically uh, could be very helpful in maybe leading us to those next steps, not necessarily a defined answer, but it would be fascinating to to see what comes from that interchange, because these are the folks that are doing the work, you know, uh, you know, Susanna, uh, Karen Gannett, 
uh, uh, Professor Crocker, uh, and you know Aton, of course, um, and shaking that that bush to see what we get to fall out. <laughs> you know, for a different metaphor, Martin. <laughs> yeah, no, I yes, I appreciate that, and and I yeah, I mean, certainly, I don't want to give up on this. I'm not giving up on this. It's a matter of how to come to uh, what's workable. And, and, and strikes the balance between actually getting it done in a reasonable amount of time and a reasonable cost and, on the one side and independence on the other side. Um, and yeah, if it's a matter of, of convening a few people, um, I, I don't see, given what uh, Eitan suggested last night, I mean, he's not gonna speak for for RDAP as being the entity until they've had a full conversation, which again is not gonna happen until second Tuesday of May. Uh, but if there's a way to proceed with what we also have currently uh, with agency of administration uh, in some manner, but having an independent oversight of an entity like RDAP, you know, maybe that is something that we can get put together, but... Um, you know, we, we would need to move obviously fairly quickly on that. Well, um, the, uh, uh, now I'm starting to see, see you, you, you take me out of my uh, comfort zone when I can't <laughs> use my uh, mechanical metaphors. Because uh, <laughs> I, I had a good car one. Uh, go for it, go for it. Go I won't for it, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh geez, we, see that's the, we've been working together uh, so long, you know, Martin and Tom and you know Maxine and I, you know, we we uh, have to be careful. We get we get on each other a little bit. Um, we're at the starting line, you know, and we're ready to hit the throttle. Um, everybody's been. Um, you know, at least contacted um, at different levels. Um, you know, we I've got calls into um, the Council of State Governments. Uh, so that brings in, you know, our whole justice reinvestment, you know, uh, discussion, you know, with them. Um, left a message with uh, Dr. Fox and um, Dr. Crocker and I will be contacting Aton and I are meeting today. Um, Kristen McClure, uh, the data officer for the state of Vermont, um, you know, reached out to her. Uh, already spoken to, uh, should say, Doctor Sand, um, uh, and you know, the list is lengthier than I have right in front of me. So. Hopefully, being able to pull uh, those folks together, uh, who are already doing like the lion's share of the work that we're talking about, um, and oh yeah, I did say Susanna in there too. Um, Eha, <laughs> upward and onward. <laughs> Right. Well, thank you. Thank you both so much, especially Coach. Thank you for for your leadership and the lot lots to uh, think about and sit with and digest. And um, we'll check back in after you have some of your meetings today and and, and phone calls. But um, yeah. So so thank you. So let's let's leave it at, at that. I think it's definitely very helpful and informative morning with a lot to lot to think about. Um, and I, I envision um, possibly calling on Selena at some point. This is a great thing for a flow chart, right? Or um, some of that sort of thinking about where, where we are, you know, different moving pieces. So Selena, go ahead. Thank you. I just had a question after listening to Martin and especially Coach Talk. Um, Coach, I know you are deeply connected with the work of the Human Rights Commission, and I know that has come up um, as a potential model or even 
site for some of this work to be based. And um, I didn't hear you mention BOR or the HRC and the players that should be around the table thinking about this stuff. And I'll just say, I mean, that there's a lot of resonance for me in thinking about the role of the Human Rights Commission, but I'm just wondering if there's, um, like, is there, uh, is the Human Rights Commission I'm trying to think about how to say this diplomatically, like, no way, we've already got too much on our plate, and that's why you didn't mention them. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I, I, I won't, well, I, I guess I can, I'm not sure, the co commission, I guess I can speak for it to a degree. I try not to, um, you know, and, and less necessary. Um, you know, we usually have our executive director make, uh, you know, those statements. Uh, but I guess what I can say is when we think about independence, we want that uh, commission to stay uh, as independent uh, as possible uh, because of its judiciary, I, not judiciary, its judiciary or quasi-judicial role that it plays uh, both in investigation uh, and then in determination. Uh, because, um, you know, that's, you know, that's the first and foremost part of the work. Um, and right now with the volume of work uh, that the commission is involved with. Um, it's regular uh, investigations uh, and now litigation uh, that we're also involved in. Um, it, it's, it, it's bordering, uh, you know, a wrestling metaphor of wanting to tap out. Um, it, it's that voluminous right at the at the moment. And then the amount of training that we do as well, you know, and we don't just do bias training, um, general bias training, you know, we do it, you know, in housing. Um, uh, there was, Amanda was doing one two days ago, um, or does many, you know, she'll be working legislature you know, in uh, some professional and activities that the legislature is going to be involved in. Um, is it totally out of the question? Nothing's totally out of the question. Even uh, when uh, Susanna spoke, uh, it's not, it takes the right fit and the right pieces for it to work the way that we would hope that it would work. And I, I think as long as we're, you know, focused on uh, progress and not perfection, you know, I, I think we can keep moving, you know, like forward. Uh, but initially, um, you know, that, that's why I didn't mention, you know, the commission. to your question yeah thank you yeah i, I actually had that, that question too so thank you selena for, for asking that. okay sorry no, 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 no. Well, go ahead i'm just looking at the time so but you get the last i, I would just suggest if there's conversations happening over the next few days that I, I think it would be helpful to include for in them if she has the capacity interest just even if you know um for all the reasons you stated, that's really not a good fit. It just I, I sort of see her as a helpful voice in thinking about the future direction of all this. So I just make that suggestion. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you again, everybody.